Let's go ahead now and continue with our reading. This is the reading from Moby Dick, page 337, from the quarter deck. And Ahab's attempt to try to convince these men that they should all go out and kill Moby Dick the whale. Let's read along. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. From the quarter deck. One morning, shortly after breakfast, Ahab, as was his wont, ascended the cabin gangway to the deck. There, most sea captains usually walk at that hour, as country gentlemen, after the same meal, take a few turns in the garden. Soon his steady ivory stride was heard, as to and fro he paced his old rounds, upon planks so familiar to his tread that they were all over dented, like geological stones, with a peculiar mark of his walk. Because of his leg. Did you fixedly gaze, too, upon that ribbed and dented brow? There also you would see still stranger footprints. The footprints of his one unsleeping, ever-pacing thought. But on the occasion in question, those dents looked deeper, even as his nervous step that morning left a deeper mark. And so full of his thought was Ahab, that at every uniform turn that he made, now at the mainmast, and now at the binnacle. You could almost see that thought turn in him as he turned, and pace in him as he paced. So completely possessing him, indeed, that it all but seemed the inward mold of every outer movement. Do you mark him, Flask? whispered Stubb. The chick that's in him pecks the shell. Twill soon be out. The hours wore on, Ahab now shut up within his cabin, Anon pacing the deck with the same intense bigotry of purpose in his aspect. It drew near the close of day. Suddenly, he came to a halt by the bulwarks, and inserting his bone leg into the auger hole there, and with one hand grasping a shroud, he ordered Starbuck to send everybody aft. Uh, to the deck. Sir said the mate, astonished at an order seldom or never given on shipboard, except in some extraordinary case. Send everybody aft, repeated Ahab. Mastheads there, come down. When the entire ship's company were assembled, and with curious and not wholly unapprehensive faces, were eyeing him, for he looked not unlike the weather horizon when a storm is coming up. Ahab, after rapidly glancing over the bulwarks and then darting his eyes among the crew, started from his standpoint, and as though not a soul were nigh him, resumed his heavy turns upon the deck. With bent head and half-slouched hat, he continued to pace, unmindful of the wandering whispering among the men till Stump cautiously whispered to Flask that Ahab must have summoned them there for the purpose of witnessing a pedestrian feat. But this did not last long. Vehemently pausing, he cried, What do you do when you see a whale, man? Sing out for him, was the impulsive rejoinder from a score of clubbed voices. Good, cried Ahab with a wild approval in his tones, observing the hearty animation into which his unexpected question had so magnetically thrown them. And what do ye next, men? Lower away, and after him. And what tune is it ye pull to, men? A dead whale, or a stove boat? More and more strangely and fiercely glad and approving grew the countenance of the old man at every shout, while the mariners began to gaze curiously at each other, as if marveling how it was that they themselves became so excited at such seemingly purposeless questions. We're going to notice Ahab is a man, you'll want to write this down at level one, of tremendous energy. He has the ability to make his sailors very excited about what it is that he's about to suggest to them. Watch how he convinces them they should all go after Moby Dick, the great white whale. But they were 
all eagerness again, as Ahab, now half Top of page 339. Bowl, with one hand reaching high up a shroud, and tightly, almost convulsively grasping it, addressed them thus. All ye mastheaders have before now heard me give orders about a white whale. Look ye, do ye see this Spanish ounce of gold? Holding up a broad, bright coin to the sun. It is a $16 piece, men. Do you see it? Mr. Starbuck, hand me yon top maul. Hammer, a hammer. While the mate was getting the hammer, Ahab, without speaking, was slowly rubbing the gold piece against the skirts of his jacket, as if to heighten its luster, and without using any words, was meanwhile lowly humming to himself, producing a sound so strangely muffled and inarticulate that it seemed the mechanical humming of the wheels of his vitality in him. Receiving the top maul from Starbuck, he advanced towards the mainmast with a hammer, uplifted in one hand, exhibiting the gold with the other, and, with a high, raised voice, exclaiming, Whosoever of ye raises me a white-headed whale with a wrinkled brow and a crooked jaw, whosoever of ye raises me that white-headed whale with three holes punctured in his starboard fluke, look ye, whosoever of ye raises me that same white whale he shall have this gold ounce, my boys. Huzzah! Huzzah! cried the seamen, as with swinging tarpaulins they hailed the act of nailing the gold to the mast. It's a white whale, I say, resumed Ahab, as he threw down the top wall. A white whale. Skin your eyes for him, men. Look sharp for white water. If ye see but a bubble, sing out. All this while, Tashtego, Tagu, and Queequeg had looked on with even more intense interest and surprise than the rest. They're the harpooners. And at the mention of the wrinkled brow and crooked jaw, they had started, as if each was separately touched by some specific recollection. Captain Ahab, said Tashtego, that white whale must be the same that some call Moby Dick. First mention. Moby Dick, shouted Ahab. Do ye know the white whale then, Tash? Does he fantail a little curious, sir, before he goes down? Said the gay header deliberately. And has he a curious spout, too? Said the goo. Very bushy, even for a parmaceti, and mighty quick, Captain Ahab. And he have one, two, three. Oh, good many iron in him hide, too, Captain, cried Queequeg disjointedly. <coughs> All twiskety, betwisk, like him, him, faltering hard for a word, and screwing his hand round and round as though uncorking a bottle. Like him, him, corkscrew, cried Ahab. Aye, Queequeg, the harpoons lie all twisted and wrenched in him. Aye, Dagoo, his spout is a big one, like a whole shock of wheat and white. As a pile of Top of three forty. After the great annual sheep shearing, I tash tego, and he fantails like a split jib in a squall. Death and devils, men! It is Moby Dick you've seen, Moby Dick, Moby Dick. Captain Ahab said, "Starbuck." Uh oh. Who with stump and flask had thus far been eyeing his superior with increasing surprise. But at last seemed struck with a thought which somewhat explained all the wonder. Captain Ahab, I have heard of Moby Dick, but it was not Moby Dick that took off thy leg. Who told thee that? cried Ahab. Then pausing, I Starbuck, I my hearties all round. It was Moby Dick that dismasted me. Moby Dick that brought me to this dead stump I stand on now. Aye! Aye! He shouted with a terrific, loud, animal sob, like that of a heart-stricken moose. Aye! Aye! It was that accursed white whale that received me, made a poor pecking lubber for me forever and a day. 
and tossing both arms. With measureless imprecations, he shouted out, Aye, aye, and I'll chase him round Good Hope, and round the Horn, and round the Norway Maelstrom, and round Perdition's Flames before I give him up. Obsession. And this is what ye have shipped for, men, to chase that white whale on both sides of land, and over all sides of earth, till he spouts black blood and rolls fin out. What say ye, men? Will ye splice hands on it now? I think ye do look brave. Aye, aye, shouted the harpooners and seamen, running closer to the excited old man. A sharp eye for the white whale, a sharp lance for Moby Dick. God bless ye, he seemed to half sob and half shout. God bless ye, men. Steward, go draw the great measure of grog. Why, Rome? But what's this long face about, Mr. Starbuck? Wilt thou not chase the white whale? Art not game for Moby Dick? I am game for his crooked jaw, and for the jaws of death, too, Captain Ahab. If it fairly comes in the way of the business we follow. Now, let's point it out for your notes real quickly at level one. Ahab is out for revenge. Starbuck is out to make money. Ahab could care less about making money. What he wants to do is kill the whale that bit off his leg. Starbuck is a businessman and he realizes the only way that they make money is to go and kill lots of whales, right? Get all the oil they can and then come back. If all they do the whole time they're out in the ocean is look for one whale, they're not going to make any money. And so Starbuck is going to challenge Ahab here. Ahab's pretty shrewd though. Watch how he, watch how he works Starbuck. But I came here to hunt whales, not my commander's vengeance. How many barrels will thy vengeance yield thee, even if thou gettest it, Captain Ahab? It will not fetch thee much in our Nantucket market. Nantucket market, hoot! But come closer, Starbuck. Thou requirest a little lower layer. If money's to be the measurer, man, and the accountants have computed their great counting house, the globe, by girdling it with guineas, one to every three parts of an inch, then let me tell thee that my vengeance will fetch a great premium here. He smites his chest, whispered Stubb. What's that for? Methinks it rings most fast, but hollow. Vengeance on a dumb brute, cried Starbuck, that simply smote thee from blindest instinct. Madness! To be enraged with a dumb thing, Captain Ahab, seems blasphemous. Hark ye yet again, the little lower layer. All visible objects, men, are but as pasteboard masks. But in each event, in the living act, the undoubted deed, there, some unknown but still reasoning thing puts forth the moldings of its features from behind the unreasoning mask. If man will strike, strike through the mask, how can the prisoner reach outside except by thrusting through the wall? To me, the white whale is that wall. Shout near to me. Sometimes I think there's naught beyond. But tis enough. He tasks me. He heaps me. I see in him outrageous strength with an inscrutable malice sinewing it. That inscrutable thing is chiefly what I hate. And be the white whale agent or be the white whale principal, I will wreak that hate upon him. Talk not to me of blasphemy, man. I'd strike the sun if it insulted me. For could the sun do that? Then could I do the other? Since th This is a famous line. I'd strike the sun if the sun insulted me. C Captain Ahab saying, I don't care if it's a crazy venture. We're going off to kill this whale. I hate the whale. We will kill the whale. Starbucks like, dude, it's just a dumb animal. What difference does it make? Ahab is going to say, it's the last thing I'll do in my life. And guess what? It will be the last thing that he does in his life. There is a sort of fair play herein, jealousy presiding over all creations. But not my master, man, is even that fair play. 
who's over me? Truth hath no confines. Take off thine eye. More intolerable than fiend's glaries is a doltish stare. Don't look at me, he says. Don't stare so, at me. So, thou reddenest and palest. My heat has melted thee to anger glow. He can tell Starbuck's mad. Look ye, Starbuck. What is said in heat, that thing unsaves itself. There are men from whom warm words are small indignity. I meant not to incense thee. Let it go. Look, see yonder Turkish cheeks of spotted tawn, living, breathing pictures painted by the sun. The pagan leopards, the unwrecking and unworshipping things that live and seek and give no reasons for the torrid life they feel. The crew, man, the crew. Are they not one and all with Ahab in this matter of the whale? See, Stubb, he laughs. See yonder Chilean, he snorts to think of it. Stand up amid the general hurricane. Thy one tossed sapling cannot, Starbuck. And what is it? Reckon it. It is but to help strike a fin. No wondrous feat for Starbuck. What is it more? From this one poor hunt, then, the best lance out of all Nantucket, surely he will not hang back when every foremast hand has clutched a whetstone. Ah, constraining sees thee, I see. The billow lifts thee. Speak, but speak. I, I, thy silence, then, that voice is thee. Something shot from my dilated nostrils, he has inhaled it in his lungs. Starbuck now is mine, cannot oppose me now without rebellion. The idea of an aside means that in the novel, Melville tells us that, that uh, Ahab is thinking, and look what he says about Starbuck, Starbuck is mine. In other words, I've convinced him this is the thing we've got to do. Notice he uses peer pressure. He says, really? Turn around and look at all the men on the ship who I'm giving some beer to drink or rum to drink, and I've told them I'm going to pay them if they help me to find this whale. You're going to stand up against all those guys? I don't think so. God keep me. Keep us all. Murmured Starbuck, lovely. Starbuck knows this is a bad idea. But in his joy at the enchanted, tacit acquiescence of the mate, to give in, acquiescence, Ahab does not hear his foreboding invocation, nor yet the low laugh from the hold, nor yet the presaging vibrations of the winds in the cordage, nor yet the hollow flap of the sails against the masts, as for a moment their hearts sank in. For again, Starbuck's downcast eyes lighted up with the stubbornness of life. The subterranean laugh died away. The winds blew on. The sails filled out. The ship heaved and rolled as before. Ah, ye admonitions and warnings, why stay ye not when ye come? But rather are ye predictions than warnings, ye shadows. Yet not so much predictions from without as verifications of the foregoing things within. For with little external to constrain us, the innermost necessities in our being, these still drive us on. The measure! The measure! cried Ahab. Receiving the brimming pewter and turning to the harpooners, he ordered them to produce their weapons. Then ranging them before him near the capstan, with their harpoons in their hands, while his three mates stood at his side with their lances, and the rest of the ship's company formed a circle round the group. He stood for an instant, searchingly eyeing every man of his crew. But those wild eyes met his, as the bloodshot eyes of the prairie wolves met the eye of their leader, ere he rushes on at their head in the trail of the bison. But, alas, only to fall into the hidden snare of the Indian. Drink and pass. Now, it's interesting for your notes at level one. What we have happening now is a ceremony that Ahab will have all of the uh, harpooners go through. It's almost like a promise ceremony 
that we all promised together we're going to kill this whale. It's a way for Ahab to convince all of them to take part in this crazy, crazy plan of his to go off and try and kill this huge whale. All right, let's pay attention now. Follow along. He cried, handing the heavy charged flagon to the nearest seaman. The crew alone now drink. Round with it. Makes them all make a promise, Shrimp right? Rats. Long swallows, men. Tis hot as Satan's hoof. So, so, it goes round excellently. It spiralizes in ye. Forks out the serpent snapping eye. Well done. Almost drained. That way it went, this way it comes. Hand it me. Here's a hollow. Man, ye seen the years. So brimming life is gulped and gone. Steward, refill. Attend now, my braves. I have mustered ye all round this capstan. And ye mates, flank me with your lances. And ye harpooners, stand there with your irons. And ye stout mariners, ring me in. That I may in some sort revive a noble custom of my fishermen fathers before me. O oh, men, you will yet see that... Ha, boy! Come back! Bad pennies come not sooner. Hand it me. Why now this pewter had run brimming again. Wert not thou St. Vitus imp? Away thou ague. Advance, ye mates. Cross your lances full before me. Well done. Let me touch the axis. So saying, with extended arm, he grasped the three level radiating lances at their crossed center. So in other words, he takes the three harpoons and he grabs them together with his hand and he